Hey, so I've been wanting to make this video for like three years. It's been a while in the works, but it really takes a deep dive into what we're looking at here to fully understand what went into this shot. Pearson, you are go for TLI, over. I've been doing model airplanes for like 12 years now, basically. They've been a really big part of like my childhood, learning to do the whole engineering process and just figuring out how to make things. I really love being able to solve problems in making a new design. Sometimes I'll do a kit too, which is a lot smoother process, but I really, really love the design and learning process of starting with my own idea, taking that to paper, turning it into an actual design that can be made, and then figuring it out a little bit as I go through the fabrication process and the build process. Then eventually you get to fly it, and if you crash, you learn from that, and you kind of carry that forward, and you hopefully improve. But one of the less commonly modeled aircraft in RC aviation is airliners. They don't appear as much because they're a little bit more difficult to build based on their shape. Yeah, it's a tube with wings and everything, but the engines hang below the airframe. They usually have to have retractable landing gear, so it's a little less common to see airliners. So I really love the Boeing 787 Dreamliner. I think it's a gorgeous airplane. It's a performance powerhouse and it just looks so good. So I set out wanting to make one. And you know, you look around at the usual places, are there any kits or anything like that for it? And I, I really couldn't find anything good or cheap enough. So at the time I was looking into this, I was in my senior year of college. We had gone through a lot of the base classes for engineering, and you start coming up on those more advanced classes. I had done aerodynamics, both subsonic and supersonic structures, basic statics of how forces move through beams and structures bend, and started some materials classes as well. During that time, we were all taking our preliminary design classes, which were the first real combining of all those engineering principles into one core project. So at that point, you're kind of pulling on everything that you know and putting together not only the, the structural aspect, but the design methodology and breaking things down to where analysis is actually making parts. I came up with the idea that I should probably try and do a project where I got to flex all of these skills together and really put myself to the test engineering wise because in reality engineering is less about making something just work or tuning it or any of these things it's mostly about using analysis to prove something will work whether that be a simulation that proves a flight trajectory works or a technique for structural analysis that tells you if something will break or not. All of these things can actually come together and you can have numbers feeding in from structural analysis that define how the thermal loads work and everything kind of works in this big cycle and it churns as a machine does to create an end product that will work on the first try. So all these engineering processes come together and they all use analysis to come up with dimensions and structural strengths and pick materials and it all kind of converges at this point of making something that you have a lot of faith, confidence, and knowledge about that you know it will work on the first try. So I set about going through my courses and pulling on all the computer software that I had at my availability to create my own 787. So with that, I set myself a few core requirements. First of those is it had to be massive. I wanted something big and impressive. And that then sets the next requirement. It's built through analysis. So it has to be built using engineering principles. Every design decision has to be pulled together using analysis and justified through that analysis. This means the dimensions of different parts have to coincide with the analysis that says why they are the way they are. And then finally, all of that comes together to allow the aircraft to fly as slow as possible because slow flight in aviation is one of the hardest things to do. And 
every time you try to slow down, you lose more performance. And it's really fighting against diminishing returns here the slower you try to go. So for aircraft performance, which was one of the classes I was taking at the time, there is a power required curve. And at the lowest point or the minimum of that power required curve, that's the lowest power required for a flight. That's the minimum you can get away with for flying at all. In reality, you need a little more, but this is a great start. So I put in a lot of the equations that I had for flight performance, basic lift, and tried to come up with a simple MATLAB program that showed how a aircraft could perform given a certain weight and thrust capability. I made things output a graph here that you can see, which has the weight of the vehicle, which weight is a force and lift is a force. So where they meet, that's where powered flight can actually happen. So the red line represents the weight of the aircraft, which is constant. And the blue line represents the lift of the aircraft, which changes as a function of the speed. So you can see where they intersect is your stall speed, which is the slowest physically possible speed that you can fly at. To tweak the curves, you can do a lot. You can lower the line going across there by making the mass lower, which obviously would allow you to fly in a wider regime of speeds. You can also increase the lift, which you would need a bigger wing or you would need a higher lift coefficient by changing the airfoil. And all of these design decisions go into reaching that requirement. So for my requirement of going really slow, I decided under about 20 miles an hour would be a great stall speed because that's incredibly slow for an RC airplane or any airplane for that matter. At 15 miles per hour here, we can see the aircraft would be stalling. So that's very, very slow being able to move. You can see based on the intersection that in this setup, the aircraft would stall at 15 miles per hour, which is super, super slow. And this is exactly what I was going for. So because the analysis sounded good, I ended up coming back to things and digging into it a little deeper. From there, I ended up revising the code, adding a lot of extra equations. I was able to figure out all the different features on the wing itself, like the lift over the wing span. This feeds into more intensive calculations down the road for structural analysis, where now I know the lift at each part and I can optimize the wing based on how much work it's doing to actually hold the aircraft in the air. So over a variety of speeds, I can figure things out and at the maximum speed and at the maximum pull angle, if I'm pulling out of a dive, I can figure out what the loading would be like on the airframe. From there, I had a little bit of a sketch drawn up and I actually put it into a NX Nastran file that I came up with for the wing to show if it would be structurally stable at all. And honestly, the initial results were really good. Um, I used kind of a guesstimate for how strong foam core would be. And I put that in and it didn't show too bad on deflection, but in this model, I didn't include any skin. So the next logical step would be to make a prototype. In any project, there's a point of no return that you reach where all of a sudden you go from, hey, this would be a cool idea to you're already halfway done with it. And this for me was that point. I ended up building a full scale wing mock-up with the spar, the secondary spar in the back, some of the ribs, and a fowler flap that moved on the trailing edge of the wing. The Fowler flap would actually increase the coefficient of lift on the wing and would allow it to fly even slower than I had predicted. I also ended up adding an aileron to the end of the wing and overall it started to look really good and I got more involved with the project from this point because it just seemed so much more feasible. The primary material I chose was Dollar Tree foam board which is really really cheap and it's comprised of two layers of paper with a layer of foam in the middle. And it's used for building a lot of model airplanes and it works great because it's just light and strong. But to better characterize things, I had to go in and do structural analysis on the material. I ended up doing tensile tests on the material to see when it would snap to figure out an ultimate stress. And from there, that ultimate stress could then be fed back into those computer models. 
The computer models also had skin added, which for skin I had selected paper, which has a surprisingly strong tensile strength and is very, very light, which is another great thing if you're trying to fly slow and keep the aircraft as light as possible. The skin contributes a lot to the overall structural rigidity and strength of the airframe. So adding that in and the material properties really boosted the analysis and it made it have a lot higher fidelity and showed that this is a feasible project. From this point, it was pretty much unstoppable. I ended up going further in on the project and built myself a full set of wings. The second set of wings ended up pushing the airframe to over 2.7 meters in span, or just about nine feet. And then I ended up specking out a couple mini quad motors that I used on my drone to run the power plant. Everything started getting connected together and, and I wound up building a wing box to connect the two parts. Slowly but surely, things started to come together. The thrust from the motor seemed pretty powerful. It was channeled through these huge ducted fan motors that I was able to build using the mini quad props. And the thrust was supposed to be more than enough to fly the aircraft. After that point, it was a matter of building up the fuselage, which is a combination of stringers made out of balsa wood that run all the way down the length of the airframe and rings or formers that are made of foam core. Each of these is about 10 inches in diameter and comprise most of the structure of the airframe. I ended up having structural issues with the airframe initially where it was too weak and I had to end up pulling on another thing I was learning at the time, which was I-beam structure and how beams are actually put together. So when a beam is bent, the top and the bottom receive the highest stress, and as a result, they're usually the thickest. That's why I-beams look the way they are, and there's not much material in the middle because there's not much stress there. I added some additional structure on the top and bottom of the airframe, and that structure ended up really beefing things up and making things sturdier. This was a good call, I think, because it made things much stronger and I felt it would allow the aircraft to last longer and have improved durability if I were to crash, which by this point, I was very attached to my project and I was very involved with it. It became very apparent at this point how big this was going to be. And I had initially just had a bunch of numbers and a wing but once everything was assembled for the very first time, as seen here, it was really impressive. My roommates and I didn't have any living room furniture, so this thing basically took up the entire living room. Both wings had flight control surfaces. They had outboard flap and Fowler flaps on the inside to be able to provide as much lift as possible to once again keep the airframe going as slow as possible. I did everything I could to get that coefficient of lift up to slow down the aircraft as much as possible and push that stall speed back. Finally came adding the skin. So the skin is bonded to the airplane really similarly to real aircraft skin. Paper sheets are bonded using little flanges that are also made out of paper that are attached to all the ribs. So each of the flanges connect to a rib via glue, then the glue is applied on the flange and a sheet is added and then it's trimmed to size. And then that's just repeated over and over again. I found it yielded a really strong and relatively rigid structure. And as I went, it actually ended up creating a really, really nice leading edge on the wing, which meant it would have high aerodynamic efficiency and it would cut through the air really well. At this point, things were mostly skinned and it really looked like an airplane. All the functionality was there on the flight control surfaces. Getting all the skin on there showed that this really could work as an aircraft and it was a viable solution to skinning it. The further I got, the more it started to look like an airplane and the more it began to dominate our living room. So my roommates and I really wanted to see it fly, but we also were kind of over the airplane as a whole. We ended up doing a thrust stand test in our living room, which probably was not too well received by my neighbors, but it did give us good data using a, a kitchen scale that we had, and it showed that the thrust was on par with what we needed to fly. Every time I'd reach a new milestone, I would weigh the aircraft and input my information back into the simulation that I had made, and all the equations would recalculate the performance of the aircraft, and every time it still maintained that the aircraft would be able to fly. The mass grew slightly off of what I had hoped, but in the end, the aircraft was right in the margins that it needed to be. 
So eventually you get to this weird point where it doesn't feel done, but it is. And we ended up having to go and get in the car and drive to the park with this monster of a machine in the trunk. And it kind of didn't feel real at the time, but when the thing got out into the sun, it was just surprisingly large. We hadn't seen it compared to anything other than our living room, so seeing it compared to the cars in the parking lot that we drove there in was kind of otherworldly. It really put things in perspective, how big this thing was, and how ridiculous what I had done was about to be. By this point, the aircraft was 10 feet long, 9 feet wide, and weighed 2.2 kilograms, or about 5 pounds or so. It is incredibly light for how heavy it is. Many other airliners at this scale would weigh double or more this weight. The construction technique yielded a pretty sturdy airframe, but it still felt very delicate, so we had to pick a day where there was no wind whatsoever, and it was a calm day. So at that point, there's nothing left to do other than throw it. At this point, you'll see the engines on the aircraft seem to stall out, and it begins to dive. They're running so hard at this point that they can't keep the aircraft in the air, and the current draw is running the battery to its limit. The motors give out, they shut down, and all that's left is some of the basic flight control systems, and I'm left in a glide. Luckily, I'm able to pull it in and land right before hitting the fence, but it still left a really spectacular grin on all our faces. The plane stopped about three or four inches away from the fence, and honestly I couldn't have asked for better because the only damage after the flight was the engines pulled off their pylons and they could just be glued right back into place. From there it seemed like a logical step to add the paint to the airplane because it had kind of proven that it, it could fly. I had felt it had earned its wings and it was worth adding the effort to do so and make it look the part. I made a couple improvements to make sure that the receiver and the battery wouldn't brown out again and everything would continue functioning even under the high load demanded by the motors. About six or eight months later, we ended up having an opportunity to go to Flight Fest South and fly it there. And man, it was a great experience to be able to go out there. The wind was so high most of the day that we had to wait until the evening to fly it, but it ended up taking off and sadly, the weight was a little too far forward, and there wasn't enough nose authority to pull the nose up and maintain a climbing flight. I ended up having to get too far away from myself to really fly the airplane well, and felt it was better to just set it down onto the runway. This flight was a real bummer because it was so close to being able to fly and it was just a balance issue. Everything else worked perfectly in the plane and it really just wanted to fly. By the time I retrieved the airplane it was just too late in the evening and we had to head out so sadly there was no chance for a reflight. After that I came to the realization that this thing was just too big to keep around and it took up too much space in my apartment and had to be decommissioned. After that I effected the repairs I needed. I took it to my parents' house to go show my dad and take it out with him to go do one last flight with it before I decommissioned it. And before I show that, I just want to say thanks for watching and uh, I hope everyone has a better year next year.